We are live. Thank you for tuning in to Self Publishing Insiders with Draft to Digital. Uh, and today we have a guest. Uh, I, I don't even know how to refer to you, Johnny. Long time friend, acquaintance. I don't even know where we fall anymore, but you were, we're friends. Of course, start. we're friends. <laughs> you, you guys, you and uh, the rest of the uh, self publishing podcast guys. Uh, yeah. That was the early days. And uh, we, we, yeah. Um, go back to those days uh you were very inspirational and influential in my career and the career of many other self-published authors so first before we do anything thank you for that <laughs> well uh, i mean you realize how long ago that's been because we got the po our podcast was called the self-publishing podcast yeah. like that's getting a one word domain name or something it's right crazy yeah, that it's nuts, and it, there was so much that that was going on at that time. It was the Wild West days, but even back then, you had already written uh, Fat Vampire by the time I discovered the show. Uh, well, that was very early on, so yeah, I yeah. don't know when you discovered it, but yeah, that was early days. Pretty early days, yeah. Was it a series yet at that point? Like, it, I thought it st started as like a standalone. It was originally a standalone and okay. the, the only, I don't know if you want me to go into this whole thing, but oh yeah, I, we're going in short. And so I figured <laughs> I could just whip that out. And then when people wanted a sequel, I was like, well, now what? Like that, now it gets hard again. Yeah. So, okay. Let's, let's, uh, let's loop back just a second. Uh, first thing we want to talk about is first of all, the book, the book is called fat vampire, but it's been adapted into a series on sci-fi, uh, called yes. Reginald the vampire. Uh, I have read your uh, your blog post and I loved it. That was a great, great post. If it, if you have not read it, by the way, uh, anyone watching or listening, I'm going to drop a link to it in the uh, comments. And you can feel free to go uh, peruse that. No real spoilers or anything. But let's talk a little bit first about um, you mentioned this in the post. But let's talk first, like why the name change? What happened? Well, uh, first of all, I should mention if you're audio and you can't, it's johnnybtruant.com. You'll find it for the post. We're going to, yeah, we're going to. Yeah, I did a full like it. write up. I was like, because I'd never seen anything like that before. And I, so many people had asked, but the reason, and I do cover this in there is um, I was, I'm going to, I'm going to admit like I'm, I'm, I'm friends with all the people in the production and they've been very gracious and letting me stay involved. And, and that said, like, I don't, I don't like the name change. I think it's a mistake. Honestly, I, yeah. I get why they did it. Um, which I don't, I don't have inside information, but my guess is they felt that it was just, I don't know. They were worried about being canceled or something. They thought yeah. maybe that it was, it was body shaming and it's supposed to be ironic. It's supposed to be that the, the slim and pretty vampire nation, which is too good for itself. Right. Those are the people who dismiss him as a fat vampire, but it was somebody up the chain between me and the small pool of people that I was working with originally and the top NBC brass somewhere, someone in there. Um, made that that decision and it was originally a temporary name and I and some others were kind of like is there anything we can do about that because man do you lose a lot of like immediate uh, like curiosity like the curiosity factor of it with Reginald the Vampire but um, I think it got name share like I think it just people got yeah. used to calling it Reginald the Vampire and they were like let's just call it Reginald yeah. so yeah. that's the only major issue I have with it and even that it's like well whatever I mean, it could have been worse. I mean, it could have been like uh, a vampire experiencing fatness would be the uh, the equivalent. Yeah, that would be really that would be really <laughs> bad. And at least Reginald is enough of a quirky name that it doesn't. Usually, it's like Sven the Vampire. So yeah, at least I mean, honestly though, I'm kind of treading on Bill the Vampire, right? Like it it's yeah. it, isn't that the other series that I think it's called Bill the Vampire, where it's like, well, that's a weird name for a vampire. So yeah, um, but yeah, yeah, I think. Um, well, it's interesting to me, though. I, I actually feel like there's an advantage in it having a, a different name because it, it sort of creates two different properties in a way. Are you? Yeah, I suppose I, I would have liked the direct line just personally, yeah. just selfishly. Um, but yeah, in the it. opening credits <laughs> of the show, it doesn't just say based on the novels by Johnny B. Truance is based on the Fat Vampire series of novels. Yeah. So they do at least make that connection for me. Good. Yeah. So <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about the origins of this, because um, according to your post, this just sort of magically happened, which is irritating to those of us who have uh <laughs> i've had options on some of my work before before it yeah. could go as far as yours has is pretty impressive well there's certainly there's certainly an amount of luck 
Um, I mean, I'm I'm stepping on you. I assume you're going to say, "Well, tell us the story of how it." Tell did us happen. the story. Yeah. Okay. It's your, your show um, now. Yeah. It. Um. I because the reason I said that it. I don't know if I use those words, but it, it did. It did have a magic feel to it, and and not just the initial. Um, not just the initial like contact, the initial option, but every step along the way has kind of yeah. felt uh, strangely inevitable, and. I, it's it's weird because I've been in the opposite position many of times where you're like, it's frustrating to those of us who that hasn't happened, where I'm like, I have the exact same reaction to something else. Well, what the hell? Like, why is that so easy? And, right. and that my thing is is not. By the way, am I allowed to swear on here? I don't know if I'm allowed to. You know, I, it's never come up. I'll, I'll, no. I'll be good. I'll Let's be make good. this a family friendly. Show. I'll be yeah. good. Let's make it <laughs> list fun for the whole family. Yeah. Um, but it, it did. Well, first of all, it came to me out of the blue. So anybody who's ever had any inquiry about an option or any, or an option, we know that those things do happen. They don't happen constantly, but they do happen. And an option is first of all, enthusiasm is free. So interest right. pre like prior to an option is just nice, but just kind yeah. of garbage attention. And then the actual option is nice because you get a little bit of money and you get a little bit of confidence in, you know, somebody believes that what you're doing is worth doing, but that is a way that is a placeholder. Like that's a right. way of saying, I'm just putting my finger on this so that you other producers can't take it. But there was an inevitability to it that I, I only look back and I go, well, wow, that was weird that there was an inevitability. It was weird that it always marched forward with the assumption that it was truly going to be made and that it, I mean, they encountered obstacles. I mean, not the least of which was COVID. And, right. um, but it, it always marched forward. And I think the reason is because um, Harley Payton and Jeremiah Chechik, the two people who approached me initially, it's like it was, they were looking specifically for a project for them to do going forward. And that's true of all producers, but since these yeah. guys are smaller and, it was like their baby in a way that if you had it optioned by DreamWorks, you know, it might just be one of a billion things that they're doing. And so from the start, and they, they told me this initially, that they were looking for something that they were going to give their best to go all the way, which meant that right. if it didn't work, it, it was just as bad for them as it was for me, whereas that's not always the case. What, uh, so once you kind of got that initial call and things started rolling, like what was... Did you do anything to help nudge things from option to production? No, no, I, I, I <laughs> sat back. I, I said, let me know if there's anything I can do to help. I'm, I'm always available. I didn't want to butt in excessively. Yeah. But, um, but, but no, but I, I didn't need to either because not only did it happen without a lot of my push behind it, um, it happened at what I understand to be a pretty fast pace for Hollywood. Yeah. Now, for yeah. those of us in self-publishing, Hollywood time is glacial. Yeah. It's like, come on, guys, <laughs> let's go. Yeah. But it did. It progressed steadily forward. And so there weren't huge periods of time where I was like, well, maybe I could be doing something. Maybe I could be promoting it. So no, I just let it happen. Yeah. you And you talked about um, all of that. I mean, it, 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 I will say that... From my perspective, like I've done some work, I did some work in LA and I've, I worked in film and TV for a while. And I, I know how like tedious and slow that process can be. They actually gave you quite a bit of trust, uh, over the, over the entire span of the production, like, you know, inviting you in, you mentioned in the, in your post that you were kind of invited in that virtual writer's room. Yeah. Uh, you know, they asked you for feedback from time to time. That, that's just un unheard of, honestly. What well, you yeah, I mean, I can, I can, I can give a little bit of background on that. I think part of it is that we got to know each other ahead of time. Um, now, let's be honest. If if I had hated these guys and they wanted to make my show, I probably would have. Right. I wouldn't have resisted. Right. I yeah. would have been like, "You guys suck," but I I did like them, and that did factor in. I mean, I didn't want to end up with a product that I hated, and I felt that they, and I don't. I felt that they would um, take care of it. And yeah. so by the time we got that far, we had already had a little bit of back and forth. So one of the things that I mentioned was Harley mentioned to me just off the cuff when we were talking once about he told a story about, well, no, he kind of hesitantly said, well, you know, I, I am thinking about maybe changing some things and just something about the way that he said it mm -hmm. made me go, OK, this isn't just an idle thing like he's walking on eggshells to see how I react. Right. And I basically said, I don't 
really care what you change. It's your product now. I understand that. And so I think that those sorts of interactions were what made them say, okay, maybe it's okay to let mm -hmm. him in. And just to be clear, like when I was invited into the writer's room, at any point, they could have said, shut up. They could yeah. have kicked me out. Like, they, you know, it was the only thing that they did that was really and truly like irreversible if I had screwed it up was Comic-Con when I moderated yeah. the panel. But yeah. by then I had kind of proven myself to be either not a jerk who was going to screw something up or a really good con, con man. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, you know, six of one, really. Yes, uh, exactly. <laughs> you, you talk about that. Um, and I, I actually, I think we should zero in on that because I think this is a component of this that a lot of authors, especially indie authors, uh, should should think about and consider. Which is, uh, you kind of did, a, you kind of went to bat for yourself, marketing yourself as someone who could promote this. Uh, you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I I don't know the people who are watching this. I don't know if I'm going to hit the ball, if I'm going to hit this like the target squarely on this. But I, I, my impression is that most authors tend to be more introverted than extroverted, right? And so. And advocating for yourself requires at least a certain amount of extroversion. And so I just kind of, um, I just kind of kept trying to find that line of like advancing and saying, I can help, I can help. But they're so, I think they were so unused to that, that they kind of didn't know what to do with it. So there was a lot of put me in front of press, send yeah. me on interviews that was either not part of the plan and they already had the plan. So they just kind of moved on or they specifically thought, yeah, no, that's not going to happen. But finding that line of like trying to make myself available to help whenever I could, as opposed to insisting that I, that I be available or really trying to butt in. Like I tried to walk that line in a very fine way. And every time they would give me an inch, then I saw that as an opportunity to make good on it, to, to prove like, okay, you gave me this much. Now, let me show you that I can be responsible and I cannot be a jerk. But I do run down in the article that's on my site about trying to get them to send me on pref press uh, yeah. junkets or whatever, and um, them kind of saying thank you, but but not really. But my persistence has almost been like, um, there's this gag in Friends where Monica says she was scrappy and she managed to get back in Phoebe's life because she right. was scrappy. And then that's right. the kind of the way I felt that I was... I just kind of kept persisting without, again, hopefully being obnoxious. And so that has let, they have given me some leeway. So no, I don't know that I, no, I can, I think I can talk about this. Um, so one of the things I'm doing, this is flashing forward in time, but I will be doing, I am doing a companion podcast for the show. And yeah, that happened I because I just kept saying, look, guys, I've done podcasts Here's some interviews. You like I'm 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 reasonably good at speaking to people, and by then they had seen enough that they were like, okay, yeah, let's let's go do it. Yeah, I think um, I don't think that that world is is necessarily up to speed on our world. Like I don't think they are complete. I don't think they're versed in like what we do because any yeah. interaction I've had with with that crowd, uh, they're they're surprised at the volume of things that we create. Yeah, you know, and the, the speed at which we that. move. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's been, um, despite my best efforts to be cool and not be up in everyone's face, I'm probably a little more up in everyone's face per their standards than they're used to, because, yeah. you know, I mean, there have been a lot of initiatives where they're willing, but I'm just shocked at how long it takes, and so I keep, okay, okay, I can do it. Yeah. When I was originally pitching this podcast idea, I wanted to get it launched before uh, Reginald the Vampire showed up on Hulu. Yeah, That didn't end up happening, but a lot of the pushback I was getting was, you don't have time to do that. Well, I did it in a day. I'm just saying. Like, I launched the podcast. I launched a website to support the podcast. I recorded an episode zero, just a three-minute introduction, created yeah. the show, did all, like it's, it was launched within a day. And yeah. I think that that world isn't used to the speed. I think some of them are a little afraid of the speed because yeah. it is a conservative industry. It's, it's, it's an industry that likes to bank on sure bets. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really like to take chances. 
And there's a lot of corporate, I got to get sign off on this and sign off on that. And so, yeah, we weird indies who aren't like the traditional right. authors they're expecting, right. but these like weird hybrid entrepreneur artists, yeah. I don't think they know what to do with us. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. Because <laughs> when they when they talk about a podcast, like I've I've uh I've run into this with inviting guests on the various shows that I host. You'll get occasionally a PR rep or somebody will say, you know, John Grisham doesn't have time to fly to Austin and do that podcast with you. You know, like mm -hmm. I don't need him to do that. I just need him to turn on his laptop <laughs> on a given Thursday and we'll just yeah. chat, you know. So yeah, it's a whole different ball game. I think your approach, by the way, like, you know, the whole play it cool thing, I, I think that probably benefited you quite a bit, right? Like, cause you weren't, you weren't being pushy. Were there limits on what you could, like, could you have gone out on your own and, and done interviews and things regarding the, the book and the show? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I could have. I, I just, um, I, I don't have the contacts. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm not going to get to variety on my own, that sort of thing. So I, I could do the podcast rounds yeah, um, I could do. I mean, we're talking right now, right? Yeah. So you know, I could do that. Um, but you know, there's a limit to what I can do. But I, there was no gag or anything. Like I, I, I wouldn't have wanted to talk about anything that normal social decorum would have prevented me anyway from talking about. Like, let me tell you about this thing that we were talking about when we were behind <laughs> the scenes. Like, no, that's that's private. That's privilege. But anything other right. than that, you know, it's all good. Yeah. You uh, is are there limits on uh? the sorts of things you can talk about, like with the podcast that's coming up, are mm -hmm. you, do you have to get that stuff vetted? I don't, I don't think so. So I, I don't just for reasons of, well, you know, you just never know. I don't want to really talk about the specific uh, specifics of yeah. the deal, but I do well, think, I mean, I'll is, talk with you over. about it later, but <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. But the, um, but basically it's, 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 my show. I mean, anybody yeah. can do a, a fan podcast. I could do a right. Breaking Bad podcast if I wanted. You just happen to have more inside knowledge, which I would. I don't know if they're worried about that sort of thing. You know, Seems I, like I might... hope. I hope they're not by now because yeah. we've all known each other for a couple of years at this point, and I, yeah. I've made some friends mm -hmm. there. It's the production has been. I'm assured that they're a unicorn. Like I've heard yeah. that most productions are not this way, but I love everybody I've talked to. Like I haven't run into anybody who's been a jerk. And I've tried to make myself helpful rather than obnoxious, which I, I think right. kind of proves some, like, even when I was on set, I spent my time, like I was a guest. And so yeah. I could just sit there and kind of be like, you know, when's lunch, give me lunch. But instead I was trying to do things like, Hey, do you want coffee? Do you want coffee? I'll go get them for you. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think that, I think that they've let me off the leash to some degree and just kind of trusted that I, that I will do it right. But, but also the companion podcast isn't just going to be me. It's going to be me and the people on the show and the producers yeah. and stuff. So they have their own limits. And I imagine that if I'm talking to Jacob Batalon and he's like, well, maybe we shouldn't talk about that. Then I go, okay, you're right. But yeah. I don't think that's going to happen. That's cool though. And that's, that's very exciting. And I, I, I kind of want to, I want to know if it does already and I want to see if it does even more so, but like how much of an impact it has all this had on the sales of the book. Yeah. You know, I wish it was more. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if it's because uh, people just kind of read a little less now. I mean, I think we all know that as authors, it's just a little harder. Um, yeah. I think we're talking about a media transfer. So the people who right. are watching a show aren't necessarily automatically going to go and read the books. But I also think that it's kind of a groundswell thing. So I'm, I mean, you probably have heard this. At, uh, I'll be curious to see if I'm right about this. But since you're, you know, at Drafted Digital and just your own stuff, I have heard a few times and have found from my experience that the fourth book is when you, if you're going to get critical mass, that's when you get it. You that's get it after book you hit four. your stride. Yeah. And so yeah. I wonder if it's the same sort of thing that it just kind of, kind of needs to be out there in the zeitgeist. I mean, um, song of ice and fire. Is that what game of Thrones was? Yeah. Like, I, so. I mean, that was already huge, yeah. but some other things that have, um, I can't think of any examples, <clears throat> but there are other things where the, the project has been huge and then the books follow. But I'm just curious if that's taken several seasons and, and that's, yeah. I mean, there's been an uptick. And we have, because we are, so at Sterling and Stone, we're, we're kind of acting as like a weird hybrid indie. So we're kind of, right. we're an indie technically, but we're, we're big enough and we're operating in such a way that we might as well be a traditional house. And 
one of the things that we're doing then is it's it's a kind of about image and brand. So normally as indies, we would sell at, so Fat Vampires is small. It's 35,000 words. Yeah. Um, I would normally either make that free mm -hmm. as a loss leader to into the series, or we would make it two ninety nine, Right. And it's, uh, I think it's five ninety nine. Yeah. And then accordingly, the other books get bigger. And so the entire box set is, I think, twenty two ninety nine, yeah. which in some ways is shooting ourselves in the foot because we would make more money at nine ninety nine because it's a 70 percent on Amazon instead of the 30 yeah. percent. But it's an appearance thing. So I guess all of that is to say that people are buying it. They're probably buying it at a slightly higher rate than they normally would, but they're buying it at higher prices. So that to me feels like at least a confidence win, but, but yeah. no, I haven't seen it take off yet. And believe me, I've been watching and I've tried to I tell am. myself, dude, stop looking every second because you're just going to be disappointed. Yeah. And, and again, it's a different product in a different market and it, you know, it's okay that one does better than the other. You just have right. to kind of come to grips with that. Uh, yeah. Th so, um, uh, hold on. I'm sorry. I have a question. Question has popped up. Let's, if you don't mind, let's pop. Yeah. Oh, up. yeah. I don't. I don't. I don't see the question. So I was wondering if anyone. Yeah. Was, uh, All right. And by the way, everyone uh, who is watching live, drop your questions in the comments, and we'll see what we can get to them. Uh, so, how did you handle the contract slash money? Do you have an agent slash lawyer, or did you do it yourself slash on your own? I added. That um, I did it myself slash on my own with an <laughs> agent with a lawyer, but not an agent. So I don't have a manager. Sterling and Stone does have a team of managers, but this was this predated them, and um, we don't have an agent either. And I did; I don't have an agent, so yeah. I had a lawyer who actually I'm remembering now. This lawyer was introduced to me. I was introduced to the lawyer. I was given the contact information for a lawyer from somebody who attended one of the Smart Artist Summit. So that was kind of cool. It was somebody who had had something optioned, and he said, "Hey, I have a, a Hollywood." lawyer and you kind of need that you need people who understand what yeah. options typically are it can't just be a normal contract lawyer so yes i would never ever have done this without a lawyer but what was kind of cool was that my lawyer advised me okay here's how the contract should be structured and i can talk i won't talk specifics for obvious reasons but in general the way that a lot of these contracts are written at least mine was is what you're going to get at each stage of the process is in the initial contract. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we do an option and then we, the option goes and they say, okay, we want to buy the rights. Here's a new contract with new terms that we need to negotiate. Like I knew from that initial contract, what I would get for any option periods, what I would get for the rights purchase. What if anything I would get out of, you know, any backend or merch or whatever. I don't even remember those details, but all of the things, the ways that I stood to make money and what rights I was signing over we're all in that initial contract. And so she was able to help me kind of parse that and, and right. understand it, but also get what was like, right. And there were times when she said, ask for this, they'll offer this and you'll settle in the middle. And that was exactly what happened. But, and I don't think this broaches anything just to be complimentary. Um, I talked through after I sent the contract to Jeremiah, Jeremiah Chechik was one of the initial partners, not NBC, but he was his company is Modern Story with with Harley, who initially bought it. And um, they he, he helped me out like he was like, OK, so you can probably nudge this up or remove this, but substitute this. And yeah. they were all things that like looking back a few years, I'm like, no, he, that was genuine. Like he wasn't he wasn't BSing me like those were things that legitimately were in my favor. So another vote for the team being awesome. Yeah, that's, uh, and that's, I, I don't know. I don't know if that's necessarily unusual. I mean, I think depending on who you're working with, uh, you know, you'll, you'll get good advice. It's just mm -hmm. those, those folks who are out, you know, like if their primary interest is, you know, you should take this deal because it benefits me. I, you know, that's when you're going to get right. sideways on things. Right. So, um, there was, okay. I don't know if you know this story or not, but, um, the book and film, uh, Bonfire of the Vanities, uh, that book was like a number one bestseller for like a decade before they mm -hmm. made the film. And then the film tanked its success. And I want to know if you're at all worried about something like that happening in this situation. Um, 
No, I'm not for a few reasons. Number one, um, the book has been successful. I actually have a little, make sure I get back on track. Cause I'm going to tell a side story and then probably you tell us whatever side story. Yeah. What I was talking about. So <laughs> that vampire, this is kind of like, so you were like how your implied question early on was kind of, how does this happen? And, and my big, the big, um, thing that I say at the beginning is it it was everywhere, right? So mm -hmm. your book has a life independent of you. By the time this was kind of, by the time somebody picked it out of the crowd, it had been out for seven, eight years. And it had been free for a lot of that time. I'd run a bunch of like book bub promotions and stuff. And as authors, we don't know the spread of our book. We might know the raw download numbers. But when I started Googling for it, and immediately backed off because I don't like it when I run into things where people don't like me. So yeah. <laughs> I just kind of like look for some good stuff. But there were like Reddit threads discussing, you know, I read that book when I was a kid. And I'm like, when you were a kid? Yeah. But it's it's these people who, you know, they're in their 20s. And so they, they were a kid when they read it. And so the story I was going to tell is that Sean and Neve, who run Sterling and Stone now, mm -hmm. were in a meeting with a producer. They do a lot of like general meetings where they're just kind of meeting people and, you know, from various production companies. And they do a lot of right. those. And they were talking to a producer and I, it was somebody substantial. I don't remember who. And they mentioned that they worked with Johnny B. Truant and that, you know, his book, Fat Vampire, whatever. And the guy goes, hold on. And he, like you, he had bookshelves behind him, but they were right behind him. And he yeah. turns around. And he pulls a hard copy of Fat Vampire. Goes, I mean, this guy. <laughs> so, like that sort of thing was just—it was out there, and it it. Yeah. So anyway, so my base, my point is that the book has a certain amount of of popularity to begin with, but it wasn't Bonfire of the Vanities. Right. So it's kind of like my standards as far as tanking that book are like it would be hard to tank it, you know, mm -hmm. just because it wasn't a, a spectacular thing. And second, um, I like the show. I mean, is it yeah. something that I would probably have picked out if I had no association to it? Probably not. It's a little younger audience on purpose. Like it had yeah. to mold around Jacob who is in his twenties. And so it has a younger vibe, but it doesn't feel like Riverdale, which right. I do not like. And I would have been really disappointed if it had been like Riverdale. And I do genuinely like it. And the Rotten Tomatoes score is above 70%. So I don't yeah. knock on wood. I don't feel like that's going to happen. I mean, you have Ned Leeds from Spider-Man as your, as one of your characters. I mean, that's the guy in yes. the chair and the guy in the chair. And that comes up all the time. <laughs> the guy in the chair, he's such a sweetheart. Yeah. I've been told that the star sets the tone for the entire production. Yeah. And Jacob is just so he's exactly what you would think. He's very, very nice. Very, very open. He doesn't hide in his trailer. At least when I was there, he doesn't sit around and be on his phone. He just talks to the people. Do you, um, has he read the books? I'm assuming he has. Yeah. Everybody read the first book at least. And they're probably yeah. reading the second book now because they're shooting season two now. Yeah. Um, and I was told, so if you've seen the show, I'm going to give a minor spoiler. So plug your ears if you don't want to hear okay. it. Okay. But All right. angels become important to the story. And there were angels introduced in the first episode. And the fact this comes up in episode two. So it is a spoiler, but for episode two, that Reginald can glamour other vampires. Those two things, especially the glamouring, yeah. did not appear until later in the series. And so I actually called Harley and I said, hey, I'm curious, if you only read, I said, did you read the whole series? Because you're pulling these items forward. And he said, no, we have a series historian. So there's somebody whose job it was wow. to go through, read all the things and note them all. And he said, I actually don't want to read them in advance because I don't want it to bias it too much. So he, yeah. you know, he's read the second book. I don't know that he's read the third. Johnny, that could be the thing that impresses me most about your entire experience is that you've got, there's an actual dedicated person who is the serious, serious historian. Historian. Uh, <laughs> yeah. If you want to talk about like in that same vein, that same feel of like, oh my God, there's a serious, serious historian yeah. going to the set and something about the epiphany of not just the set, but the offices and going, yeah. there are like several hundred people and yeah. they made a little business about my book. Like there are these people whose full-time job, like their livelihood right now depends on creating this thing about my book. It's nutty. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just, you know, you were writing about uh, being there and you happen to be there for the, the like opening scene, which is, mm -hmm interesting uh and hearing your words come out of actors mouths is always yeah. a trip uh how how much have they deviated i mean is it 
fairly, you know, is it, is it close? Or I have is it... two answers to that. So okay. they deviated a lot and a little. Those are the two answers. Right. So originally, so the first, the first episode, if you allow for the things that had to go with the demographic. So again, Jacob is, I think, 26. Mm -hmm. And so his love interest had to be around the same age. His, his business had to make sense. Like I had a guy work in like office space in an office that makes a little less sense for somebody in their, you know, mid twenties. So they made it in a slushy shack, which necessitated more young people. And so if you allow for those changes, the first uh, episode is actually very much like the first act of the book. Like it's very close. Mm -hmm. And they even kept things like, so that scene I was referring to is the scene that opens the book. It doesn't open the TV series, but it does open the book is where Reginald is making this like prayer to an unseen God about why did he get such a raw deal in life? And so all of that stuff was very, very similar. As I went on though, I was really curious because my book, again, it's like 25, no, I think it's 35,000 words. Mm -hmm. And so it's basically a novella. And if you were to read it from start to finish, it would probably be a four hour audiobook. And they had 10 hours to fill in season yeah. one. And so I immediately thought, well, there's got to, they're going to have to do something. And so there's a lot of, like I said, demographic sorts of changes. But the plot, once I started paying attention to it, is not very changed at all. What they did was they filled in. So if you read this and you go, what's all this stuff about Maurice and Angela and okay. Angela didn't exist in the books, but certainly their relationship didn't. And there are full episodes devoted to like Maurice's backstory. Yeah. And so they kept the bones of the Reginald storyline. I wrote it limited um, third person. So it's everything is from Reginald's point of view. If he doesn't see it, we don't know what happened. Right. And so because it's a multi-perspective TV is a multi-perspective medium they needed to add those other POVs when he isn't necessarily even there. And they needed to be able to go back and forth because in TV, you can't just tell one uninterrupted story unless you're 1917 and you make yeah. it work. Yeah. So that's my answer is that there are a lot of things that aren't in the book, but there are things that fill in gaps in what is otherwise a coherent, like yeah. true to the book sort of story. So what? in terms of things like the, the rights that you maintain um, over the books, that sort of thing, is there anything that you're limited now uh, in doing with the books? Like, could you release, for example, a, a recovered version of the book that's titled Reginald the Vampire? Could you do that? You know, I don't know. Hmm. I, I actually don't know that. I, I don't, <clears throat> I don't see why that would be a problem though. I, right. I, Maybe I'm wrong. I Before I were to do something like that, I would obviously look it up. But I do know that I had to finish. I have a side series mm -hmm. and I, it still needed another book. And so right. I didn't think twice. By the way, the last book of that side series is breaking the fourth wall. It's basically yeah. like the story of what actually happened. And so <laughs> um, I know that I'm not limited in that way. But I do know, and I don't think any of this violates confidentiality because it's just kind of, I think, how things work is when somebody buys your rights, they're buying the rights to, to the, to the world. Yeah. Because if they're, if, if they were to say, okay, we're, we're, if we only want fat vampire one, or we only want the fat vampire series, then their conflicts could arise. And somebody could be like, well, I want to make the Maurice, you know, the vampire Maurice series. And I'm like, no, mm -hmm. no, no, no. NBC owns the rights to that. So, but no, I, I, I think, I know that we put a new cover on it with a, a sticker. Mm -hmm. um, that, that says now a sci-fi thing or whatever, but we yeah. had to get permission for that. And cool. if we were to use what I really wanted to do was use that graphic that they use for Reginald the vampire, where it's just Jacob with the, the beanie on and he's looking straight forward, those fangs out and the orange background, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> that would have been a nightmare to get. They, you know, even just getting that little seal was, was a thing. Wow. That's a, that's interesting to learn. I mean, cause you would think that they would consider that part of the marketing that they would actually I could probably convince encourage them. it. Yeah. yeah, I probably could. It's just like, is that the hill I want to die on? Like I'm already trying to do 
various other efforts. Let's just say that various other things yeah. I'm trying to get them to let me do for the mutual good. I'm not trying to do yeah. this for me. Yeah. And so like, I think there's only so much they can handle. <laughs> yeah. 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 Don't push your luck. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a couple more questions have popped up. So this one's from some, some guy named Mark. Oh, I know uh, that guy. Yeah. <laughs> what was it like being treated like a celebrity when you visited the set of Reginald Vampire in Victoria during filming of season one? That was pretty sick. It was um, because I don't remotely consider myself a celebrity. I mean, when I would go to the, the smart I don't either, Johnny. things, yeah, of course. <laughs> like, why would you? I mean, you know, there were like when I would go to those things, like people knew who we were because we were it was our event. But yeah. um, authors aren't usually celebrities. There's like five authors in the world who you could maybe consider a celebrity. So, right. And I'm talking like F list, like nobody knows who I am. So yeah. but when I went to the set, um, I tell this story in. It, I don't know that it's in this, the, the article that you read, but I did a series of deeper dives that the second one publishes today. There are six that I'm like sharing like all my photos and all the stories. And it took six posts worth of time to write it up. But in one of those, I tell this story, which is um, I went, I, I was, uh, there was a teamster that was my driver. Like he's an office driver. So whenever I need to go anywhere, he would drive me. And, and I got in the car with him the first time and I said, his name was Jeff. And I said, Jeff, you have to tell me everything. Give me, give me the real story. Like, I don't, I don't want the polished version. You have to tell me like what it's really like. And so he proceeded to introduce me to, to everyone. Yeah. Um, and so at one point we go into the makeup trailer and um, the two actors who play Sarah, her name is M. Hain and um, Todd, who is Aaron Buchholz, uh, were in two chairs. And that's all there was, was two chairs and, and makeup people, hair and makeup. And he goes in and he says, hey, is it okay if Johnny comes in and says hi? And um, I, I was like, I, I just followed his lead and he wasn't used to giving tours. He didn't tell any of them who the hell Johnny was. <laughs> he just says it OK if Johnny comes in and they gave me a badge and the badge yeah. was backwards. So, you know, you couldn't really tell. And so I don't realize this until after I've been talking to them awkwardly for a while because they're getting their hair done and stuff like who am I intruding all of a sudden? And um, at some point, I, after just making pleasant, small talk, but awkward, um, M said, and, and what, what do you do with the production? Like, it was kind of like, why are you here? Was that question. And I said, oh, I wrote the book and I turned it around. And then she kind of did, the, there was this moment. And then she goes, oh my God, oh my God. And she swore a bunch of times and then gave me a hug. And this is during COVID times where you're not supposed to do that. Yeah. And um, that kind of reaction, now hers was really exuberant, but I got that a lot. Oh, like there was always a sincere double take. It was never that thing where you go, you know how like, I mean, everybody who's listening to this is an author. Yeah. And if you've ever had somebody ask you what you do for a living and you say, I write books, there's yeah. this response that people give you that's kind of like, oh, you, you, you poor person. Right. <laughs> I'm, I, good for right. you. Good <laughs> for you. It's really great. It's nice that you're indulgent. And, but they don't like nobody takes you seriously. I know. This was hey, look, the opposite. Pal, books of that. bought my house. Okay. <laughs> right. Exactly. And nobody gets it. You know, nobody they're just like, it. oh, I'm going to pretend that I'm happy for you. Yeah. And uh, this was the opposite of that. This was like, oh, we're here because of you in a weird way. And, and I always got a sincere, like, oh, and then they would have follow up questions. Um, I talked a lot to, uh, so the girl who plays Claire, her name is Tylee. And because she's a minor, her mother had to be there the entire time. And so I talked to her mother a lot. And it was the same thing. And, and what was cool with that is, uh, again, no spoilers, but later in the series, Claire develops some abilities. She's uh, 12 in the books. I think she's a little older. No, she's 12 in the in the series. Tylee's 14. Um, and they, um, uh, but they hadn't read the whole series and, and Claire develops a lot of abilities. And I, I kind of, you know, was talking to them about this and they didn't know that. And so I said, oh yeah, she becomes really important. They were really curious. They were like, oh, ooh, that's, ooh. And it was in real time watching them react to like their future trajectories based on, you know, I said, if they stick with the books, yeah. then your character is going to get super important. She, you know, she's monumental. So yeah, it was great. It was great. Yeah. Uh, okay. Sorry. We got a couple more questions that pop up. How did you, how did you balance writing and working for a steady paycheck? Uh, well, I don't have another job, so that's yeah. the main reason. So I'm it's a full time. Very helpful. <laughs> yeah, I'm a, I'm a full time indie author. So yeah. um, I do. That is a blessing, and and I I try not to take it too lightly. But um, I I I don't I don't need to work for a living. I can I yeah. can write for a living. So it was um, now it wasn't always that way. I mean, to be fair, um, I've always been uh, kind of unemployable because I'm 
I'm an entrepreneur through and through. So there was a time when I was balancing non-writing work yeah. that was still not traditional work. Like it was entrepreneurial work. It was back when I had um, my old blog and I was still doing some like courses and stuff. And so I still, but you know, I was always able to make my own schedule. Um, yeah. You know, I think the standard advice would apply for anybody who's juggling that, whether they have a book or TV. Now that said, when the book rights finally went, it was a nice paycheck. Yeah. And um, that would have allowed me some time. Let's just say. Yeah. Yeah. Always, always handy. Money is, yeah. money is good for the yes. exchange of goods and services. Money is freedom. <laughs> money is freedom. So, uh, you know, you mentioned a, a little bit in the uh, article that you actually got to do kind of a cameo. Uh, so are you now, where would you place yourself? Are you, are you at a Lee child level cameo or is it a Stan Lee level cameo? Well, I don't, I don't know Lee Child's cameo, but I think I will say, I'll answer the question by saying that cameo is probably overstating it. <laughs> okay. uh, I mean, I basically, I, 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 this is one of those things where I'm trying to get my wishes across without being pushy. Right. And, yeah. and there were a few times during this process where people kind of like, you're starting to get pushy. Right. So, um, you know, I kept making jokes about, can I just walk by in the background? Can I just be like the Alfred Hitchcock thing, right? Like, can yeah. I walk a dog by in the background or something like that? And they, um, I, eventually I kind of got to the point where I was like, okay, I, I, I get it. It can't happen. There, there are some sort of rules and, and regulations. Like even they, I think they usually call them background actors, but a lot of people would know them as extras. Like there's rules governing yeah. that they're like, there's, there might be a union, like there's politics involved. And so once that was kind of like implied, I kind of went, okay, you know, maybe not. But then Jeremiah, the director, uh, came over and he kind of chucked me on the arm and said, I got you in. And so they basically, if there, there's a shot in the, it's in the pilot, it's repeated later in a later episode. I don't remember where, but it's in the pilot. And I think it's even in the one of the teasers where Maurice and Reginald are outside the slushy shack, yeah. which is Reginald's place of business. And they're talking, it's, it's after he's been turned and the shot includes them and the window of the slushy shack. And there's some dude in a black fleece who's sitting there drinking a slushy. And you can't see who he's talking to, but there was somebody else there. She just never made it on camera. And that's me. I'm like this big in the background, but um, nice. we'll see. Maybe I'll push for season two. You've, you've beat me out, man. There's there's a shot of my arm and shoulder in tin cup. <laughs> nice. Oh, in tin cup. <laughs> yeah. I saw tin so. cup. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, they were, they were filming kind of in my area and I, and I got to be an extra, but the only shot of me in the entire movie was my hand going up cheering for his, uh, his, final well, Hey, shot. you got, you got an arm and a hand. I got it. So, all right, well, we are, we're at the end. We're going to have to wrap up, uh, which is unfortunate. There were actually a couple of questions left, but I don't think, well, we I mean, time. don't stop on my account. If, if you have more time uh, i certainly have time or i could come back i don't care i just yeah, i will have to have people we'll have, have questions background. yeah people, people have questions i want to answer them so yeah yeah whatever. and uh, you guys no. can send me questions too like by the way flagrant plug i made that post and opened up the comments so that people would mm -hmm. ask me questions okay just saying it's at johnnybtruant.com and you'll see it it's one of the top posts and yeah, it just, i guess it's called that. fat vampire to reginald vampire Ask questions in the comments. I'm happy to answer them. We have uh, dropped that on screen. So if you're on uh, YouTube, you can find that. And uh, it is Johnny uh, with a the letter B, not B-E, but johnnybtruant.com. Right. Uh, always great to talk to you, man. It's been a while and uh, we, we need to not let that happen again. So Yeah, I think um, we need to have that lunch that uh, we, we never We do need it, especially since we're in the same uh, town now. So yeah, it's kind of a circle up. It is absurd. Uh, but for everybody else, you can have lunch with me too if you want, everybody. Uh, you just just say the word. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and wrap up. I'm going to play a quick uh, little ad spot just to wrap us up. But before I go, uh, Johnny, thank you for being a part of the show. We really appreciate it. Yeah, uh, always, man. Drafted Digital has been good to me. We love it. We, I'm glad to hear that. Everyone else, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, so that's the best way to show support for the show. Make sure you bookmark dddlive.com because that's where you're going to get a countdown for interviews like this. Every Thursday, we have an interview and a podcast release. So uh, make sure you bookmark that and drop by. And as promised, here's a little look at uh, DDD print for you. And we'll see you all next time.
Ebooks are great, but there's just something about having your words in print. Something you can hold in your hands, put on a shelf, sign for a reader. That's why we created D2D Print, a print on demand service that was built for you. We have free, beautiful templates to give your book a pro look, and we can even convert your ebook cover into a full wraparound cover for print. So many options for you and your books. And you can get started right now at draftadigital.com.